Okay. Let's try this again. I'm Nate Riggs with NateRiggs.com, and I'm here with Chad Whitman of EdgeRank Checker. Thanks for joining me today, Chad. Yeah, not a problem. So uh, today we want to talk a little bit about this algorithm that Facebook has, EdgeRank. And it's interesting because we've known about EdgeRank for you know a little over a year. At least the general public has known about it for a little over a year. But coming from a company that's developing apps inside of Facebook's API, um, how much information do you guys actually have about EdgeRank? Uh, we, it started out um, way back with Facebook at F8 2010, like showing the algorithm on 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 the on the PowerPoint slide or whatever during their whole conference one. I'm just explaining the concept, and then it basically evolved from from kind of me seeing that and starting a process of just deep research into the insights that I had to take a look at how all these different components were playing together. Um, and so it started out just, uh, you know, just diving into the, the select group of insights that I had access to um, at the time. And um, I built a little tool that basically take, took a look at the Facebook insights um, that Facebook provides you through the API. When you go and click into the insights um, as a page manager, uh, those same insights except they export to the API. Um, and so we basically built a little tool that looked at different kind of signals to kind of look at how EdDrink is on average impacting your average piece of content. Um, and basically through that process, we rolled it out a little free tool. Um, a couple hundred people started using it. A couple thousand people started using it. A couple of tens of thousands of people started using it. What we were able to do from that point on was basically start to test things. So we started to do research and say, how, how is a comment of impacting um, the news feed compared to a like? And so it kind of evolved from having access not only to you know, insight data to analyze the same data that you have as a page manager, but then having it kind of across a wide spectrum to be able to do research to then start figuring out little bits and pieces of that algorithm. So one thing that I loved, um, Facebook at FMC came out and said, the average page reached about, I think it was 16%. And about a month earlier, we had reported uh, that we were seeing about 17%. And so a lot of times I feel really great about kind of our research because I feel like we have a really nice sample size of, of kind of the, of the bigger ecosystem. So we're allowed to do basically research into our stuff to figure out what's, what's exactly pulling on the strings along with obviously looking at insights with, with the rest of the world. So there was, it's really interesting. There was, um, Maybe two years ago now, there was a study that came out from Bitly that looked at the average shelf life of different type of content updates. And I think the, the number that they placed on Facebook was 3.2 hours. Uh, truth or false? True or uh, false? We did a study probably six months ago, and we found uh, our number was three hours. So I would say that that sounds in line with exactly what we're seeing. My guess is moving forward that number's going to shorten. Um, just due to the fact that there's so much content coming on the news feed, so many more people are getting smartphones and they're starting to do, you know, create more content onto the news feed, and not to mention brands that are starting to look at this and say, hey, how do we maximize our exposure? Um, you know, we want to be looking at this, this thing. So I kind of look at it as organic SEO kind of moving forward and understanding where you kind of rank and where you place and then you sponsor sport, stories and whatnot to do basically uh, PPCs through the, the Google spectrum. I kind of look at it as, as two similar industries that are evolving. So you bring up a really interesting point, and, and I know a lot of people feel this way. There's there's obviously an organic and paid side to Facebook, uh, which is very similar to the organic and paid side of, of search and Google. Right. Um, the one of the the folks at our firm, Jeff Karcher, uh, when we talked about this, made a comment that you know back in the day. Uh, when Lycos was still around and started to drop advertisements in the actual organic stream, that was probably the death of Lycos. And right. today, they're really they're not really long, any longer a player. No. Um, now, Facebook is looking at this in-stream promoted post type stuff. Uh, I've used it on on a variety of accounts, and it's it, it does work pretty well. But long term. Where do you see this dynamic with Facebook now pushing advertisements into the news feed, and, and how is that going to affect the EdRank algorithm? Yeah, that, no, that's a that's a great question. It's something that you know that I obviously think about a lot because it, it impacts our business. Uh, depending on we need we need brands to be obviously using Facebook to, and, and users using Facebook, and then for us to even help anyone. Um, so the way I kind of see Facebook, it's, it, you're right. I think it's at a huge kind of crossroads. They're they're at an opportunity, and I think that I think the IPO. Um, I'm a big. I'm not a fan of IPOs for tech companies because it normally start. They start worrying about the stock price. I mean, Facebook's rolled out like 
15 features since the IPO, and it's in all these different ad things and changing this, changing that. And I think they're going away from the actual user experience, which is you know probably what did in Lycos or in you know MySpace, whatever. Um, so I'm really worried about the users starting to be like, what exactly is that? Because I don't think they're quite educated enough, the average Facebook user, to say these are flat out ads and they're getting angry and mad because Facebook is taking enough social indicators to make the content pretty relevant, but the more they push it and the more they add, I'm, I'm more leery that Facebook users are going to start to be worried about it. And with that aside, you know, let's say the users don't care and they keep using content and they're the, keep using the news feed and they are clicking on the ads and they just, it's not a problem to them. Um, I think kind of moving forward, I, I'm going to see, we kind of, the way we're looking at it is kind of a balance between we want to maximize your average organic basically reach and engagement so that you're maximizing your ROI of, of leveraging the, the investment you made in the fans. And so we want to look at maximizing that. But I think Facebook's going to kind of push that paid media kind of, you know, subtly to just say, hey, if you really want to go crazy or you really want to do this or that, use paid to amplify and then use kind of viral to, to take it even further. So when I say that, the reason that I note that we're kind of looking at that, if you look at like how impressions are broken down in the API, they're passing organic and then paid and then viral. And so I think from Facebook's perspective, they really want to use kind of when the way we're going to look at it is use organic and to know what needs to be paid and then apply paid media to the things that are growing organically, then to hopefully increase the virality, which will then re-increase your organic. And so we're... Yeah. That's the path I see Facebook kind of taking with it, and that's the path that we're going to try to help our customers on identifying those opportunities of, uh, first of all, maximizing organic all the time, and then, hey, this is an opportunity to apply paid so you can maximize virality as well, and back again in that circle that we all know about. Very interesting. So another thing that I thought was interesting in the past couple months, uh, or at least the past year, we've seen you know, Pinterest is born, and suddenly everybody's all about the visual web. Uh, Facebook releases timeline. You can even go on LinkedIn and see how they've changed their their uh, layout to have this bottomless scrolling, as, right. as I like to call it. You know, whereas the organic results, you could scroll down on Google and then you had to click to the next page. Right. Um, with the implementation of this kind of bottomless scrolling, does that really affect where your content gets placed in the stream, or are you seeing in terms of like user behavior that people just have a propensity to keep scrolling down, and, and how does that affect how brands are marketing on, on something like Facebook? Yeah, I think, the, I think there was something really interesting at the last um, um, F8 that Facebook did. They talked about how they really, when they when they combined the two news feeds, you remember the top news feed, the most recent news feed, and then now you kind of had that hybrid news feed, and then they changed their mind and then added a little filter again that there's a most recent and then, a, you know, Anyways, they talked about the concept of that new hybrid news feed and what they were trying to accomplish. And they talked about how they wanted the news feed to be kind of like a newspaper for each user depending on their browsing habits. And so they talked about the person who checks Facebook once a week, how they want to log in the news feed and only see the big events, the big things that are very important to them and kind of get rid of the, le the, re the rest. If they have someone logging in every 30 minutes, they basically want to show you everything as it comes in. And, and I think that that philosophy is interesting because it gives you an an idea of kind of what Facebook's thinking on how their behavior, user behavior, and what they want to do with that behavior. So when you talk about, you know, scrolling down, I feel like the, the users that um, that are using Facebook very frequently, every 30 minutes, every hour, they're probably going to be less likely to scroll because they've already been there 30 minutes ago. And so they're they're kind of scrolling by refreshing, if that makes any sense. Um, and so yeah. it's it's kind of an interesting comment content. So. The way that I think Facebook kind of looks at that and how I recommend a brand is like you need to understand how frequently your, your users are basically consuming Facebook because if you have, let's say you had like a Mountain Dew type account and everyone's 14 and they're always checking their news feed, you can probably get away with posting a very aggressive high post frequency strategy that's really pushing a lot of content because a lot of your users are basically in a most recent type environment because they're always checking that feed. So it's basically now more like a Twitter feed to them. Whereas if you, let's say you have a, yeah, sorry. Probably from a mobile device as well. Ex yeah, exactly. And if you have a, an audience that's uh, maybe older and checking, you know, very kind of infrequently, you really need to focus on really finding the right piece of content and really nail the timing and bring back that post frequency. And so I see it as kind of a, as, I don't know how much of it is actually the scrolling part of it, but the 
of how often they're coming and, and, and engaging with it and can kind of consuming the content is interesting to me. And 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 I and Facebook's going to continue to you know to push this stuff forward and whatnot. Hello. And we're back. All right. Okay, so so not only did, did the wonders of Google come back on, but I think we recorded that entire dead spot. <laughs> so I apologize about that. Um, where we left off, we were talking a little bit about um, how brands can leverage the opportunity to stream. And I think you, you bring up a really interesting point in that um, it really does depend on how often the user is checking Facebook. Uh, and that's, you know, with, with everything I'm hearing about Facebook's yeah. really, like, push towards mobile, and, and given the mobile apps right now are, are terrible, <laughs> um, just go out and come out and say that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but that's interesting because suddenly content disappears on the fold much more often. You know, right. so, you know, that brings up the question of, of timing. Um, I know one of the things that Edge Rank Checker does, and, and I actually used this when I was at Bob Evans, was to really determine when, in terms of your page activity, when are people visiting the page, when are people checking that content. Can you right. explain to me a little bit about how you guys approach figuring out what times people are engaged with Facebook content? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting because it's, you want to find out basically when these people are consuming the content and you and our whole angle you know is we want to make sure that you're pushing out your best content when they're on when they're online I, one analogy I use is uh, like like maybe like a commuting or like we actually had a we were managing kind of a, a fishing site and they basically they had all of their content cons consumption before work and after work so they were either you know there was maybe more of a blue collar thing and they couldn't check Facebook at work and they consumed all that content before and after and and without taking a step back to analyze that you might you know they might have an ad agency running that content and just publish at 10 a.m. every morning and no one's online and consuming that content so it's, it's so incredibly important to understand that what we try to do is we we actually take for every single one of our customers for every single one of our pages we look at every single post every single hour um, and we keep hitting the API and wanting to understand what's what's gone on in that past hour and that's something that a lot of the analytic companies aren't particularly doing because it's it's very taxing on your resources from just from the API development perspective it's it's above and beyond the way Facebook anticipates uh, analytical companies accessing their data so we're actually going in there every hour and we want to take a look at what's happened over the past hour and so we start analyzing that content in, the, in that data stream to say hey we're seeing a lot of engagement happening at this time of day um, let's let's really push content that way and test it out and then our recommendation section adapts depending on that how that those tests go but we really want to push and optimize for engagement because basically the more engagement you can get with your content um, that basically makes an assumption that you're getting the proper timing um, and then if you're building the engagement, you're going to hopefully build your affinity with those users, which hopefully will give you higher edge rank for your future objects um, when, you're, when you publish out the content with the right timing. Yeah. So we're actually using these hourly snapshots to try to, and we're, we're working right now on increasing those snapshot accuracy maybe within like 30 minutes to give us, again, a little bit more data to say, hey, these people are, because, I mean, most people aren't on for an hour, so we want to get that accuracy a little bit more tighter and, and really start to say, hey, uh, this is what's happening then, and then I would love to go in the future and start figuring out those demographics for you. Say like, hey, your you know your your young male teens are on here, and your you know your adult thirty year old males are online at this time. So it's something that we're trying to explore right now. So is auto publishing then on on the uh, the roadmap for you guys in terms of that type of of quote unquote social performance <laughs> software? It's it's one of those things where um, one thing that. It's, it's something that I, I debate about uh, with the future of our company, but the one thing that I that I thought was really interesting was the Facebook announcing that they were going to do the targeting, uh, the post targeting. It, it, I'm assuming you've heard a little bit about that or what they're trying to do. Yeah. Apparently, hasn't rolled out fully yet, and I'm really curious to see how Facebook kind of approaches that. Um, I wrote a little piece about how I would recommend basically Dove Chocolate publishing content 
on Valentine's Day, and I said, you know, imagine being able to publish that same piece of a piece of content, let's say, to single women in the morning to say, you know, ha you know, buy some chocolate today. You know, it's a great day. Blah blah blah. You could say to married men at 5 p.m. like, hey, you're on your way home. It's Valentine's Day. You better buy some chocolate for your wife, and you could. Tailor that message, the same you know Valentine's Day concept, to six, seven, eight, ten different demographics all throughout the different times of day, and you need to know when those demographics want to consume that piece of content. So it's going to get crazy if that post-targeting stuff takes off, if the big brands really start using it. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of work for uh, you know content creators and, and community managers. Figuring that all out, and so if it starts to get crazy in that way, and there's there's a need for people to really, like, hey, well, how am I going to target these people and schedule it? Um, you know, I'm all about solving needs, so quite yeah. possibly, if if that starts stuff starts to get crazy. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've I've used tools like uh, Context Optional, for instance. Um, they're now part of Adobe, uh, mm -hmm. but they they got that granular with being able to geolocate, so you could right. publish certain updates to certain zip codes, or but it never got as far down as proximity, but uh, the move to to isolating those posted demographic information suddenly makes Facebook a very valuable tool because every business out there today has two or three audiences that they're targeting right. versus just that one general blanket. And and that was always the one knock that you know we whenever I talk about they would say a brand a lot of big brands would ask us uh, hey should we have one big global brand or should we break it all down and one example I always use was Nike. Nike just acquires fans by the fact that you could be into cross-country running, you could be into tennis, you could be into their basketball, you could just like their logo. And so when Nike, the global brand, says something, the odds of it, if many people enjoying that piece of content, if they, if they think do something about the NBA and you have a segment that only cares about the NFL, they're not going to engage with that piece of content. So the huge brands like that normally struggle mightily with reach and, not, and things of that nature. But with this opportunity, they basically – are able to maybe start to recoup that. And what they did to kind of combat that was they had a Nike football page, a Nike basketball, a Nike tennis, Nike running, Nike everything to make sure that they had the right kind of fan acquisition models for each brand. But the other brands won't necessarily have to do that work um, if they could target right through in that, that specific page. Yeah, I can't imagine what it was like to be a brand manager at Nike. Oh. Something that's that spread out, right? And so many different. I mean, you have some people. You know, they only want promotions. They could care less about a new photo shoot with Derrick Rose or something. And it's like, how do you appease all these people? Excellent. Well, hey, where can people find you? Uh, this this has been a great discussion. So so, where can we read your stuff? Um, uh, the EdgeRankChecker dot com blog, um, and I also blog a lot of times for SocialFresh dot com. Um, and I'm always on Twitter answering questions and just having fun, uh, twitter.com, at Chad Whitman. So um, I'm, I'm kind of everywhere, and I try, to be, I try to be as helpful as I can because we're in a unique position where, you know, you know we can help people with understanding kind of what's going on, and, 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 I, and I love to talk about this stuff. So. Well, I know we used your app when I was at Bob Evans, and we got a lot, of, a lot out of it, and it was a great tool for us. So I appreciate all your insights, and uh, keep, keep up the good work. Yeah, thanks Nate. Thanks for thanks for the tough questions and uh we'll talk soon. All right, thank you.